Through a Scottish Prism, the programme that is unapologetically pro-Scottish independence and anti-Westminster rule. Everything we say here is viewed through a Scottish Prism. Brought to you by Barhead Boy. And welcome back, folks, to Through a Scottish Prism. Nice to have you back. Been a week since we last had a wee chat. Nice to see you all again. Um, we've got a few changes uh, in, our, uh, in our show today. I hope you're going to enjoy some of these changes. Um, I've got two of our younger members of the, the Yes Movement and the Alba Party on to talk to us and give us the, the youthful view for all the old fogies on here like me. Um, and the later, I've got uh, Roger Anderson, the, the historian, who's doing um, going to do a wee snippet every week or every other week for us on the uh, historical facts of Scotland because there's such a... Um, a thirst, it would seem, among you for Scottish history. And you, we missed out on so much. And uh, we'll have our first bit later tonight in the programme, um, which is about the Ruthven Barracks. And uh, it was a British base up there in the Highlands. So that's first. I am joined by Robert Reid, originally from Perth, um, and stood for the Alba Party in May in the old Aberdeen ward. And uh, I'm also joined by Josh Robertson, um, who is a member of the Alba Party and a member of the NEC. Robert and Josh, welcome to Through a Scottish Prism, lads. Lovely to see you here. You just make me feel older than ever. How are you? Thanks for having us, Roddy. Good. Are I'll you still... You for, I'll forgive you for interrupting my Jubilee celebrations tonight. Oh, well, yeah. Oh, yeah. God bless the like Jubilee, yes. It's, uh, yeah, I know. Yes, I, I am <laughs> celebrating it by ignoring it completely. Or... <laughs> Should, should I say I intend to lampoon it um, uh, much more? So, uh, are you uh, are you getting ready for next week's game here already? Are you either Robert? You get your Scotland top on. You're, so, you're hurting from Wednesday I'm not, night. I've not been changed since Wednesday. Just made it back home. So. <laughs> well, that's, well hey, that's the joy of being a student, my friend. That's the joy of being a student. <laughs> so, as I said, guys, when you when you joined us, you, you're two of the young team. Um, of the Yes Movement and the Alaba Party. And, and it's it's a joy for us old stagers to see new blood coming through. But there's so much more you could be doing. What, what was it, Josh, that got you interested in politics in the first place? There were so many better things you could have been doing with your time. <laughs> I, well, uh, it was indoctrination, Roddy. I was so uh, my my papa and my family were all nationalists since before I was even anywhere near being born, seventies uh, and eighties. So as soon as as I was born, that was it. I was dragged along. In fact, my first political memories is climbing up and down lampposts in North Lanarkshire, uh, cutting down Labour posters and putting up SNP ones. <laughs> uh, that was uh, my first. Thing. And then and then after that, uh, I kind of went to I went to uni uh, and then. Um, just seen some of the, the, the inequality, especially within the, the disability space. So quite a few members of my family that have, have got disabilities and uh, have a disability myself. So I've seen some of the, the issues that were surrounding that and the actual lack of voice that kind of people had. Um, so that's what kind of drove me back into politics uh, kind of when I left university. Um, but I mean, independence has always been <laughs> always been in my heart since I was a young lad. I mean, it just it's one of those things that I think when you're growing up and you know when you're people who talk to you and tell you the facts about how why Scotland should be independent, it's one of those things that we almost struggle to see why we're not already. Um, and that's something that actually I remember quite clearly growing up is just you know why are we independent? Why you know it's a shock that other people don't think we should be. Um, I've been thinking that since 1968. So <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's incredible. It's not a new feeling. Okay. Uh, so and then uh, after I left uni, I got you know kind of sucked back into to fighting for kind of local issues and local people who were kind of suffering a wee bit of inequality and a wee bit of injustice, and then I just kind of that was it. Get sucked right back in, and I've been trying to leave it ever since, Roddy. But <laughs> I keep getting keep getting dragged yeah, back yeah, in. No, not really. You're, no, it is it is like a drug. It really is. I tell you, it gets it gets worse or better depending on you look at it. What about you, Robert? What what brought you in? What got you excited about getting involved in politics? Um, pretty similar to Josh, actually. My my dad was really political. Um, he was in the the army for thirty four years with Black Watch, and uh, he would he would admit to you that and to anyone asks, he, he's gone through quite a political journey. He's, he actually voted for Margaret Thatcher at one point because he was roped up in the army. Um, then voted for Tony Blair, and then Tony Blair sent him to Iraq, and uh, he actually joined the SNP from Iraq because when he was over there, he thought what the hell are we doing here? This is not a place that we need to be. And from then on, he was a big SNP supporter. 
and I was still quite young at the time. And then the referendum came along and I was too young to vote. I was about 15, I think. So I just missed out. And uh, I was always known at my school as being the big SNP guy, big independence guy. And it was really, that was the key issue for me when I was younger. Before any kind of like looking at more in detailed stuff, it was just for me, Scotland, like Josh said, could and always should have been a nation. Um, so I joined the SNP at that age and kind of, I still remember, I think a lot of people perhaps maybe a bit younger than me forget how, uh, what a great leader Alex Salmond was and uh, what he did for Scotland and the movement and uniting the movement and getting us on the cusp of victory. And I'd been quite dissatisfied with the SNP over the kind of, probably most of the time I was a member to be honest, but, uh, and then I was such studying in Florida and uh, I remember hearing all Alex Salmon's doing a press conference. So I, I looked at that and uh, was watching it. And when he announced this new party, uh, as he was speaking, I resigned from the SNP, joined this new party. And uh, I was so frustrated because I couldn't get involved in the campaign because I was so far away. But um, so in, independence is the biggest thing for me. And when I came back to Scotland, I got involved in my local ACU and uh, kind of really got involved. And, I didn't have anyone to vote for, actually. There was nobody going to be standing in my ward, so uh, I just kind of put myself forward and thought, well, there's plenty more people like me in my position, I'm sure. So, Did you enjoy the experience? Yeah, it was a, it was a brilliant experience. Um, kind of different, I guess, to what I was expecting. I wasn't really sure what to expect, but um, the people I was with, the LACU were absolutely fantastic. We are uh campaign organiser Teresa and uh, election agent Gavin were superb and getting out speaking to people were, was brilliant and my ward was a really deprived ward, it's one of the poorest in Scotland and uh, getting out and actually speaking to people, you, you kind of, a lot of the time the poverty might bypass you if you, if you don't kind of look below the surface and when you go speak to people, see the conditions that people are living in and how they've getting, they're getting no support, no help and the biggest thing for me when I was knocking on doors and speaking to people was seeing People, people would always say, oh, I've never had a politician or somebody running for uh, election come to my door. And that was one of the biggest things that when you see, especially how the kind of more mod uh, the bigger parties, uh, kind of modern SNP are campaigning with their kind of easy squeeze bus, they go around all the cities, all the, all the local areas, but avoid these kind of deprived areas. And yeah. for me, politics and politicians should be getting into these areas because these are the people who don't vote and people that really, really should vote because it's in their interest. To, so for me, that was the biggest thing I took out of it. And no matter what the result was, it wasn't the result we all wanted, but um, it was that start. And I think we should continue to kind of get into those communities and speak to those people because that's what will win us independence, getting these people active and out there. Yeah, well, I shouldn't be too despondent. The SNP were going for 11 years before they got their first victory and they only held that seat for one month. That was back in 1945. And then they had to wait another 22 years before they got another seat. And that was the wonderful winner for doing. And I remember that night well. Anyway, Josh, are you, do you have ambitions to, to get a political career? Or is it just a, a full-time? No, not at all, Roddy. Although okay. I was similar to Rob, um, that when Alex announced uh, that you know he was launching the party, uh, I was phoning everybody I could to try and get uh, a, a space on the list to stand. Um, just to be a part of it, I mean, to be a part of the inaugural uh, launch was just something special, you know, to stand up there next to, you know, your political hero. Uh, you know, a lot of people are, are sick of fans, well, you know, but actually, you know, to stand there next to that, I remember we were up at the, um, I was standing up in the Highland area and we were outside, uh, you know, the um, just outside the city, just looking over the bridge. And there was so many people there that were so excited for Yes Again, something that I hadn't seen since 20, 2015, 2014, 20, 2015. So, it was great to be a part of that. So now that I got dragged into that just by uh, being unable to say no. <laughs> what an opportunity to stand next to, to to be on the same list as Alex. So that was class. But um, no, I mean, politically, um, it's just one of those things that I get dragged into. I mean, my real passion, Roddy, is for helping people with disabilities. That's what I do as, as a day job. I'm currently doing a master's in bioengineering to make kind of medical devices for people who um, are, are unable to kind of um, interact with the world, you know, maybe they're bed bound or they're stuck in wheelchairs or whatever. So, um, that's kind of my passion is using technology to interface between them and the world. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, I do that in lecture at Glasgow and stuff. But it, it's quite funny because Rob's probably had this leveled him as well because we're young and interested in politics. People mm-hmm. are like, oh, you must be a career politician. They're so later. kind of. Oh, sorry, Roger, it's a wee bit delayed. <laughs> That's right. Um, there was a, in the early days of the, the Scottish Parliament, 1999, there was a lad called Duncan Campbell, a young boy. He was at that time, I believe, the youngest member of the Scottish Parliament. And he's now a leading QC in Scotland. And so, you know, don't, don't discount yourself. It, it, it can happen. Uh, that, that's I, something that I was... On you go, Rob. That, yeah, that... That was something that I like. I was kind of apprehensive about getting in, uh, like standing for election, because I would, oh, I looked at I'd been in the YSI and I'd seen the kind of obvious careerists that were stepping forward, and I didn't want to be seen as as one of them just looking for a a, a job or looking for um, some kind of place, a comfy position within the party. I I just did it because I wanted somebody to vote for, and that was going to be myself. So so be it. And but I wanted to get that album message out there. Um, so I, I don't have a, a particular interest in getting a career in politics by any stretch of the imagination. I just kind of want independence. Mm. But we need we do need people to step up to the plate. If everyone takes that, you know, takes that, that's that's that's, uh, definitely. Uh, that's why I put myself forward for the problem. NEC. We as need well. people to step up, lads. I I mean that's it. I mean a lot of people, mm. uh, especially in politics, can have ideas and things they want to implement, but then. You know, are not are, are too scared, they may be too timid to put themselves forward positions where they can maybe implement that change. And if everyone takes that view, you're absolutely right. Then we're just left where we are. We need as many different voices, and in, in particular, you know, for for the NEC and for the, the leadership of the party. I mean, we need as many different people as possible to try and drive us forward to where we're wanting to be. So, uh, if, if everyone sits back, then <laughs> you stay stationary, don't you? Huge problem. I mean, as Robert touched on earlier. The one thing about the Alipa party is it's got the best of the best campaigners because these are all people. I mean, when I went to the Alba conference at Hamden recently, well, it seems recently, we're a few, was it April? I can't remember when was it, March? March. Um, most of them are all fellow ex SNP who I'd seen over the years at the SNP conference. These are the, the, the people who know how to campaign. So any candidates coming through are going to have some pretty good experience, but See, like myself, there's a lot of them old in the tooth. That's why we need to get youngsters like yourselves. And that's my next question to you, Robert. Um, you know, when there is all the distractions of, you know, clubbing, pubbing, whatever, gaming, whatever there is, how do we get young people interested in politics, interested in looking at it as either a full-time hobby or a career? Um, how do we do that? It's it's tricky. I think we were in such an amazing position in 2014. The public, not just young, but old, every kind of social class were really interested in, and wanted to get involved. And I think particularly the kind of political leadership since then has neglected that and, and is much happier to, to play to a certain base rather than get into areas that... Uh, we we need to to energize and and I think young people are particularly are one of them and I think it's it's always difficult to get young people into politics because I think it's it's seen as like an old man's game like oh, was it pale was it pale male and stale that's the kind of the term that's used and uh, so maybe people like myself or Josh or other young candidates from any party stepping up to the plate I think automatically gets people they know it more interested in it so maybe people more people like this but um. I don't know. I think, particularly with the administration down in London right now, that kind of kind of sleaze and corruption instant, uh, instantly turns people of my age off and thinks, "Wow, they're all mm-hmm. the same." Um, so it's a tricky question to have, but I have no answers, no real solutions. But I think having kind of people you can look to and say, "Oh, that's who I want to be like," or uh, if they can make a difference, why can't I? I think is the only way to really do it. Uh, the thing is, Josh, if people like myself try to be trendy and go into Instagram or TikTok, it just is cringeworthily embarrassing trying to be, you know, hip or whatever the latest phrase is, I don't know. So it is down to people like yourself um, who have to come up with the suggestions, the solutions to do it. And the other one is that what it, what, what's not good is if you can get them and they go to a meeting, and I would say this to anyone listening out there who's from a LACO or a branch, is the last thing you need to do is when you get the young team in, is to then we'll have the, 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 the convener's report and then the treasurer's report and the secretary's report and the membership secretary, and everyone's bored to bloody tears. 
by before the before eight o'clock. So we need the young blood to come up with young ideas, and you know there is also yes, have your separate you know the separate um, groupings. Um, have you got any ideas, Josh? So I mean, we've I can speak kind of my point of view of, of what Alpa have tried to do. Mean uh, Christina Hendry were were tasked at the very beginning to try and build it from. From me, from me and her to as many as possible. I think we went through two to about maybe 10 or 11, I think Robbie was now. I think that are, are quite regularly in the chats and stuff. And we've just done that through, um, you know, I think the big thing, Roddy, you're exactly right, is to try and get everyone talking to each other, kind of build that camaraderie that you'll know existed in SMP way back in the yeah. 70s and 80s, you know. That was a big a big part of it because if you keep, you know, if you're not doing um, successfully electorally in terms of winning seats, what keeps you going is the camaraderie and the kind of common vision that you've got. So, We've been trying to recreate that a wee bit and just things like having a stall at conference. You know, a lot of our members, that was the first time we met, was the first conference way back uh, at Greenock. Um, and that mm-hmm. was a, a big boost, I think, for people to get to know each other, get to chat to each other. Uh, and then also uh, for this election, we also did a wee, a wee mini road trip up to Aberdeen, Rob. I think a few people went up, didn't they? I think uh, Scott <laughs> Fallon went up it, and a few people went up to, yeah, it, to watch it, Rob get kicked out of the <laughs> yeah, that was that day when I got kicked out of the uni for daring to talk about independence. But, uh, that, was, but, but that was the best publicity we could have possibly get. Uh, but just to, ha- to hang on to that, I mean, uh, oh, sorry, I was just going to say, just to yeah, hang no. on to that point, I think one of the the key things that we have to do, and, and Rob kind of touched on it, is is not to let the youth kind of be hijacked. I think at the minute people see engaging young people as actually a virtue signal, and that's what seems to be what people are trying to engage young people with, of progressive politics or, you know, they want um, you know equality stuff without actually really addressing the issues that are affecting young people at this moment in time. And I think if we stray too far from trying to address those issues, we're going to lose the yes vote that we take for granted from youngsters, you know. We're going to have to see people our age um, been able to get onto the property ladder, or we're going to have to see people our age been able to keep up, you know, decent jobs. You know, with the, the income and inflation, the massive, you know, it's going to be such tough times, and the young people are going to be hit hard. And so we're going to have to try really hard to campaign for issues that keep a positive yes message out there, saying, you know, vote yes, not just for virtue signal and not just for, you know, because it's what you're supposed to do, but vote yes because you can have a better future. Vote yes because you're going to have a better job at the end of it, or vote yes because it's going to be economically beneficial in the next 10, 20 years for you and your family. You know, so I think that's really important. We have to try and bring it back from virtue signal and actually into real policies and real things that make sense to people our age. You know, that you can just sit and look at it black and white and say, "Oh, yeah, of course we're going to vote yes. That's that's better for our country rather than the mismatch we get at the moment." You know. Yep, you were touching earlier, Robert, and. Um, Community politics, I think, is, a, is something that's very important for us to break through um, and to have a cause. And we, we, we t- talked about having the referendum. That was a great thing to, to bring people in. But what Josh has just mentioned there is that there's a lot of heartache and uh, hurt coming down the line. And in those areas that you were talking about, the poorest areas in Scotland, the people who are most of the people who need the elves, they actually do are the ones that we need to be reaching out to. And that's surely where the young the younger members can help the most, is to get out and get into those areas and encourage social action and social cohesion to, to fight this poverty. No, I completely agree. And um, I think, like what Josh said, you need to show that politics can make a difference. So in, mm-hmm. implementing policies that do help people's lives will give people... Will, will, Pause and make them pause and think. Okay, how did that happen? Oh, it's because these people take this action. Oh, I want to get involved in that because I want to create a kind of a better situation for myself. And I think one of the reasons I've been so engaged with Alpa is because it's so exciting being able to kind of form a party, I guess, and 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 lead and direct that party in, a, in the way that you want to see. And I think that's the exact same for independence. We have a, a kind of we've got a blank canvas with independence and getting people involved, getting them excited to be involved to, to kind of create the country that they're going to live in. I think that's the biggest compelling thing for me. And uh, what better way to do it than get into these communities and actually uh, change the lives of people that really need it most. And I think, I don't know if it's like a secret or anything, but I think at the NEC you've discussed a, um, a kind of battle bus, not an easy squeeze bus, but ones that go into the places where politicians don't normally go to. And I think that'll be touring around the country um, this uh, this summer and, and autumn, and I think part of that needs to be a, a real registration drive and get 
getting into these communities, people will be shocked that politicians, politics is active there, get them registered. So the next time it comes around, they'll be able mm -hmm. to vote. Because that was one of the, I think, biggest things for us knocking on the doors. You find a lot of people weren't registered, weren't interested. So you need to show interest in them before they'll show interest in you. Mm. Well, um, you know, the one thing I would say, Josh, is that before you know it, it, it I know this might sound far-fetched, but as long as you too, and it just seems like a blink away, um, and the years go by so very quickly. It's important that you put down a marker and we get more and more people involved because we've got to get Scotland free. I've spent my life trying to do it, and we're no closer now than we were on the September the 18th, 2014, at 11 o'clock at night. Uh, absolutely, and I think that was what one of the big drivers, Rob's probably the same, that drove me into the party, you know, <laughs> My grandfather, my, you know, he he walked every street in the local town for independence for years, Roddy. And you know, there's other stalwarts of, of the branch that I knew for years and years and years that have actually all subsequently joined Alipa. But you know, to see them, to see how hard they fought for independence, just to see it being ripped away from them, really, by people who were supposed to be on their side. You know, it's it's you know, watching my papa cut up his membership card. You know, it was he was heartbroken at doing it. You know, it wasn't an easy decision, and I think. Uh, that, it. <laughs> that's, you know, you probably felt the same, Roddy, and I think that's something that, mm -hmm. um, you know, as a party, Alipa, we have to kind of maybe be the first to kind of go over that hurt a wee bit as well, you know, in terms of reaching out, because we're going to have to take everybody in the Yes Movement with us. It's not just those that agree with us, you know, we're going to have to take absolutely everybody. And I think mm -hmm. the wee Alipa book <laughs> is an absolutely perfect tool to do that. And as Rob's saying, you know, getting on the bus, uh, I know... <laughs> but Rob, we've been tasked as a youth to, to man it, so you've you've dropped us in it there. But um, we're going to be going in there and you know into local areas with the wee Alpha book and actually showing people look. This is this is the we are still campaigning for Indy. Whether you're any other party, whether you're SNP, Greens, whatever, this is this is the real tangible evidence of campaigning that's been going on. So come on, come and join us. <laughs> so if there's anyone yeah. listening, you know that are that are maybe not of the Alpha persuasion, then. Just look at what's actually happening. Look at what's being talked about, you know, and actually look at what parties are actually physically doing something. And the wee Alpha book's a tangible bit of, of campaigning. So yeah. it's going to be vital for us going forward, I think, Woody. It is, and it's something that we can upgrade every soon, and a second edition, third edition, when you add yeah. things. Yeah. Anyway, look, guys, the clock's beating us, but don't leave me quite yet. I want to, you to come on because we're going to have a wee review of the week shortly. A moment. Um, a new bit, a new bit of our show, folks. Where um, uh, Roger Anderson, the historian, is going to do a, a weekly history lesson, if you like, uh, for you, um, because it will. Um, you've always seen how you much you enjoyed his, his wee history chats that he, he did in a couple of blogs. So his one today is on Ruthven Barracks. Please enjoy it. Hi. This is uh, Roger Anderson. Um, I'm currently at a place called uh, Ruthven or Ruthven Barracks, uh, which is near King, King Usi in the Highlands. Um, you can see it just behind me. It's a place that a lot of people don't visit. Thousands of people travel past it on the A9 main route north. Um, few people actually visit the barracks. Uh, the barracks are sitting there behind me on a hill. Uh, the site is quite an ancient site. It was the site of a castle uh, before the uh, current building uh, owned by an ancestor of uh, Charles Edward Stuart's uh, body, Prince Charlie. Um, uh, Alexander Stuart, uh, the Wolf of Badenoch. Uh, now, he built a castle here, a stronghold, one of many. Uh, that uh, castle, the ruins of it, sat on uh, this hill behind me um, into the, the, um, the later period that I'm really going to be talking about here, which is the 18th century, uh, early 18th century, uh, and it was um, it was uh, knocked down uh, by um, occupying British forces uh, in order to build this uh, these barracks behind me. 
Um, why are they interesting? Well, they're interesting because they're they're one of the few survivors um, from that period. Uh, the British Army actually built barracks uh, and and fortifications across Scotland, uh, as you'll see if you if you take a look at uh, at the Stennis Historical Society website, uh, the cantonment registers, which are only really just being being explored in recent years. It, it played an important role. Uh, there was a fair-sized garrison, which I'll talk about uh, when we get up there, uh, inside the uh, uh, house in that building. As you can see from a little bit of video there, pretty formidable, formidable fortifications. You wouldn't want to be attacking this. I'll head on up again. And here we are at the uh, top of the hill. You can see glacial features down the down in the strath, uh, past the building. These are the, the ruins. This building was attacked in 1745 twice. Second time it was burnt. Uh, the Jacobites used positions on the hill just opposite me to fire on the barracks. Um, first time on the march south, they were unsuccessful in taking the barracks or destroying it. But as I say, second time in 1746, they actually managed to destroy or burn the building. There's the little historic Scotland. It's been around for a few years. Notice there, just introducing the uh, the building. And you can see the... There we go, we're into central parade area. Two buildings either side of me which are exactly the same. Very Georgian. Uh, they are mirror images of each other. These are barrack buildings. Buildings at the end. You can just see parapets there. Troops would have stood sentry at the top of those parapets. Buildings mirroring each other again at every corner, um, including offices. Officers' quarters. This is one of the barrack buildings. You can see where the floors went above me. Uh, this picture is here to, to give visitors some idea of uh, of what life was like in these barracks. Um, probably not as comfortable as it's shown there. Um, each block, there's two of these designed to hold 60 soldiers, redcoats, uh, British soldiers. Uh, so 120 would, be the, would have been the full complement. Whether there was ever a full complement, we don't know. It clearly wasn't a very comfortable billet and the locals were very, very hostile. You can see there are slits for firing out of right the way around these buildings, just above the slots where the, um, the beams for the floors would have gone. So this is not, <laughs> this is not friendly, this is not friendly pleasance uh, for the locals. Uh, the locals aren't friendly to these guys. It's uh, clearly built for defensive purposes. So here we go, um, a map, just to show you where the, um, the main fortifications um, to the north were, uh, British military bases. So we can see Ruffin here. Um, this is, uh, and you can see the military road network here. And Fort Williams over here, this is uh, a fort that's been completely obliterated uh, by time. Um, we've also got uh, Bonera over in the west. You'll see that's uh, just by the Isle of Skye. That's essentially guarding the entrance to Skye, the ability of people to cross to Skye. That, that building was exactly the same as this one. Um, same plan. Plans are there. Uh, on this board. Uh, you can actually see them in the National uh, Library of Scotland uh, on their website. Um, Inversnade down here at the head of uh, Loch uh, Lomond uh, is another site exactly the same uh, uh, building built there as well. This is the best preserved of them all. Um, by far the best preserved. Uh, so this is really your major uh, look your major into military life, raycoat life, uh, raycoat occupation of uh, Scotland um, in the 18th century. 
little uh, drawing there of uh, the Jacobites actually, actually attacking the fort, uh, the barracks. There you can see some redcoat troops running around inside. Someone's down on the walls, etc., etc. So here's our here's our real, real uh, sort of uh, big one. Um, they, um, as, it, as it says here, February 1746, um, Jacobites with artillery support uh, took the uh, took the garrison. Um, now, after Culloden, on the 19th of April, uh, 1746, they actually received their final orders here. This is where the Jacobite, uh, the Jacobite rebellion, the Jacobite rising. Um, depends which books you look at, um, who pro or anti-Jacobite is talking. Uh, the rising actually ended in this place, uh, and there are there are descriptions of that sad end um, in a number of uh, memoirs of the uh, of the period, including uh, uh, Lord George Murray's aide de camp, John Johnston's uh, memoirs. Very, very interesting. Apparently, according to him, the men were willing to fight on. But on the 19th of April, they were given the orders uh, from Charles Edward Stuart that it was every man for himself, or in 18th century terms, let every man speak his, seek his own safety in the best way he can. The area is replete with stories of Jacobite caches of arms hidden in this area, uh, numbers of uh, numbers of Jacobites, including John Roy Stewart, who I mentioned earlier, very important figure, uh, went into hiding in the locality. He was hidden on grant lands, uh, despite the fact the grants were theoretically neutral. Uh, large numbers of uh, of Jacobites hid on their lands, including at Loch and Elin, uh, if you ever go there. Uh, there's a ruined castle on uh, on an island. Very, very pretty place. Um, and uh, Many more, uh, many of the Highland troops, the Lowland troops, uh, tried to integrate themselves back into life. The Highland troops, uh, many of them, as we now know from the cantonment registers, fought on. Uh, so even this wasn't the end. This was the official end. Uh, they fought on in the hills. Uh, and they fought essentially a guerrilla campaign against the British government, the British army, the Hanoverian government and army. Uh, so forget all those histories you've been told. This is where it officially all ended, but even then they fought on into many of them, the Highland troops fought on, and half the army was Highland, uh, half of it wasn't, um, again, something you might have been told. They fought on into the late 1750s at the very least. As I say, there will be information on that. Coming from the cantonment registers, uh, Murray Pittock, uh, coming uh, when that book is published and that will be the first examination of this uh, the reality of what actually happened rather than the stories that we've been told so don't believe what you're told but this place is quite an important spot in uh, in Jacobite history so there we go so that is Rutherham Barracks a part of our hidden history in Scotland place that many more people should visit I guess but uh, the fact that they don't in a sense makes it uh, quite atmospheric it's quite a place and certainly well worth a visit for anyone coming by or a stop off for anyone coming by this place on the A9 heading north and you can just see the landscape around as the foothills of the Cairngorms the backs of the Cairngorms there so Rutherham Barracks 1721, occupation of Scotland, military control of Scotland. They don't tell you about that in school. Thanks everyone, see you again sometime. Cheers. There folks, I hope you enjoyed that and found it as interesting as I did when I saw it for the first time. It was good stuff and it just shows you, you know, all those things we didn't. Um, and we'll have more of those as time goes on. But it's now um, time for our weekly review. And with the guys here, I think we'll get some great insight, I'm sure, from these lads. Um, I'm also delighted to say we're joined by Yvonne Ridley and, and the Hi. Peacocks. Yvonne, there you go. Um, I hope you feel as old as I do sitting here with these two youngsters. Um, well, you speak for yourself, Roddy. <laughs> well done. <laughs> ten out of ten. <laughs> yes, uh, I should say these no, three it's youngsters. Refreshing. 
it's refreshing to uh, to see and hear young people engaged in Alipa and and the cause for independence. Yeah. It's, mm -hmm. And the, the peacocks agree with you. Yes, they are. They're in fine song tonight. Yeah. Yeah, you have to get them mated and get them calmed down. <laughs> it really will. Um, but of course, this week, um, there is only one big bit of news in Scotland that's worth discussing. And that is that uh, Conor Goldson signed a four-year a four <laughs> deal with the Rangers. Uh, now, of course, is the, is the Queen's Jubilee. Um, it's everywhere, Yvonne. And I know, um, I can imagine that you've got, I can't see your bunting from here. Um, how are you finding it all? Well, I'm rather annoyed because I had ordered um, a lot of bunting, um, Palestinian flags to show my support for Palestine. I ordered uh, Scottish flags, the Saltier, obviously. And I also ordered um, some Algerian flags as well mm. because my husband is Algerian. And not one has arrived Um so there are no flags flying uh, here at the moment. And I was in uh, London a few days ago and it's wall to wall um, of union flags. The butcher's apron, as uh, yeah. Tommy Sheridan uh, so eloquently called it. Um, mm. it it's terrible you know it, it looked london looks as though it's some fascist capital at the moment well Obviously, actually actually um it is the only <laughs> highlight uh so far apart from prince Anne visiting the penguins in edinburgh zoo or some somewhere like that the only Good real penguins. highlight was uh, when Carrie and Boris Johnson yes, stepped indeed. out of their car um, into the, uh, the the service today, and the boos were really audible. Wow. Um, so much so that even the BBC had to um, acknowledge that uh, there were some boos among the cheers. Some, some, Josh, in the way out, it was even worse or better, depending from our point of view. Um, it was absolutely, I mean, when when a royalist, unionist, um, you know, union jack waving crowd are booing a Tory prime minister, um, your tea's out, as we say in Scotland, surely. Uh, you'd have to think so. I mean... It's incredible, or as I was, I, I, you you look see some of the coverage of it, and you just think that what century are we living in? Why is this still? Why is this still a thing? Why are we all out parading those that have got their foot on top of us? It's mm -hmm. absolutely baffling. Like I, I don't understand. I mean, to be fair, I've not watched any of the coverage. You two, are, I've, I've got bigger stomachs than me. I think I'd broke if I, I watched even five minutes. I couldn't handle it. But yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, there's a gardening program on. I've been. I, I thought I was. I, I mean, I should make a declaration. I think anyone that doesn't already know, I am a devout, rabid Republican. So I am. But I, I want to play fair, Robert. Um, the first minister. Um. Of course, quite rightly, as the First Minister of Scotland, we have to allow that, sent best wishes to um, Mrs Windsor. Um, um, and I accept that she had to do that as the First Minister of Scotland. However, she turned out looking very comfortable in St Paul's Cathedral with uh, her husband in tow, um, Mr Sturgeon, um, looking very happy. And I would note that uh, I don't think Michelle O'Neill, the First Minister of Northern Ireland, was there. Um, but... She didn't need to go, did she? I didn't even notice her oh. there. I mean, I, I just uh, oh. was flicking through the channels when I came across the booze of Boris Johnson uh, as he entered the cathedral, and I just switched off at that point. I'm impressed, Roddy, that you stuck with it and, uh, <laughs> and took a peek at that. No, I didn't. It was an article, actually. I didn't. No, I didn't watch it. No, no, I didn't do that. No, no, there was a picture. Uh, it was actually in the Herald. Did you see it, Robert? The picture of her in her pink suit? No, I, I've not seen that, but I did see Boris when he was in It's now up on the screen, believe me. It'll be up on the screen in, in the show. Um, um, she but, was looking very comfortable. Um, just, 
just on that, Roddy, I don't know uh, if anyone's seen the BBC article on it, the way that she was, you know, she was fanning on about it and, and that basically just saying that how, how great of an experience it was and how much wisdom she had. And I mean, you can kind of, you kind of expect that from, from Nicola these days, but the bit that caught me uh, at the bottom of the article uh, was when, you know, the, the reporter asked her about an independence referendum and, and Nicola actually said, and I'll quote her here, I actually don't think that this weekend is the time to really be talking about these things. And I nearly fell off my seat. <laughs> As the I, first don't minister. You, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to swear when I'm online, but I mean, when you hear something like that, I just, dear mother of... Uh-huh. Um, yeah, uh, but, but it's not good, is it, Robert? Well, the Boris Johnson getting booed was fantastic. So I think that Absolutely. will strike fear into the, every single, that deepest, darkest England Tory, that more than any kind of opinion poll would. Because that is the flag waving Brit that they've been, uh, mm-hmm. that that's their base. And if they're booing you, then you're, you are in serious trouble. But I seen um, the new First Minister, Norman Allen, she put a, a, quite a, a, a good statement out. Um, obviously, being a Sinn Fein representative, perhaps unexpectedly, the, the kind of tone of it, I thought it was it was mature, it was grown up, and it was it was fantastically put. And so there is an element of you're an elected leader, and you've you've got to you've got to have these have these kind of diplomacy, and I think so. Nicola Sturge has done a part of that. The part that Josh just said there was I've not seen that, but that is staggering. I think it, if anything, it's the exact time. It's the perfect time to highlight why, and yeah. and a, a country like Scotland, the poverty levels we have, spending millions of pounds on pomp and ceremony, in a country that doesn't support having uh, the monarchy any longer. I mean, I live in Perth, and in Perth uh, they've spent God knows how much putting this big screen up uh, outside the concert hall. And there was a photo from there today during the ceremony, and not a single person was was out there watching it. And uh, hmm. I think that pretty much sums up the attitude of people in Scotland, and especially at a time like, like we are today. There's the one with the town crier in Aberdeen as well. He's standing there on his own. Um, the other one, Yvonne, was, of course, that uh, Nicola quickly reiterated the SNP position that Scotland will be a monarchy, which is... It, it's quick, it's clear water between fine. them and the Alaba Party, who are now a Republican Party. <laughs> hmm? it, it, um, the monarchy is an outdated... Um, institution it it has no relevance to today and i think that we all know that uh once elizabeth the second is gone the first. Um, elizabeth the first. there will be or elizabeth the first sorry uh once once um betty windsor goes that mm-hmm. is going to be the the end of it and i certainly I in the the so-called commonwealth um, the anger and apathy um, in equal measure that has come through from the common, some of the Commonwealth countries is, uh, uh, is palpable and I think uh, will have uh, shaken some of those in the, the House of Windsor. There's very little future left for the monarchy in the Commonwealth countries and there's, um, I think, very little future left for the monarchy, full stop. Um, One thing that I did see uh, was Charles and Camilla. I thought it was two royal lookalikes on um, EastEnders, uh, the BBC soap. And it wasn't, it, they, they, it was the real thing. And I just think, you know, what have they descended to that they now have to go touting for for business in uh in a fantasy east london uh you know uh, television soap um so they'll be needing jobs soon so well i, tell you what, the, I hope they job. don't think about acting because they were <laughs> useless at uh at acting and um you know i was going to say well, at least prince and <laughs> At least what? Andrew wouldn't sweat under the lights. We know that. <laughs> we know that Prince Andrew doesn't sweat under the, the hot lights. He would be okay. Well, um, I mean, he's, it, he's down with COVID. I mean, who knew uh, that that yeah, was going yeah. to happen? You know, Ooh, COVID's no longer coincidence, a Coincidence, eh? Uh, but, um, Josh, um, Keir Starmer, um, 
um, or Sir Keir, or Lord Keir, I don't know what he is, um, um, said it was our patriotic duty to celebrate um, the, the nation's monarch. Um, how did you take that news? I mean... <laughs> And I heard that you listen first of all, I did it. It's Sir Lord Keir Starmer, the head of the Labour Party, first of all. I mean, that yeah, <laughs> that's no, it's, it's, off anyway, but uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's unbelievable. I, I don't understand. I think it was a recent statistics come out said it was £89 million pound a year it cost to, to, to house them or host them or whatever. I mean, what a complete waste of money that is. But the real the real junk position for me was, was driving down. I live in the central belt, um, so you have to go through some loyalist areas to get to wherever you've got to go and uh, you know on one side you've got all the union jacks and the flags and the queens <laughs> kid you not on the other opposite side of the road you've got families coming out of food bank you've got families yeah. coming out of food bank and looking on to a family that's getting supported 89 million pound a year i mean how uh, how does that happen in this day and age and how does that happen to a country and how does a, a supposed labor left-wing socialist party's leader support it how I mean, I, I just don't understand. I mean, I, I can kind of understand people's ties to, you know, the monarchy in the good old days and all the rest of it, but they're gone now. That ship has sailed. That's Britannia's away, <laughs> you know. Yeah, it's, you but, know. I mean, it was so bad. Even the Queen didn't turn up for the St Paul service. She didn't want to turn up either. She thought it was a load of nonsense. I mean, it was, but the other one, it out there, I don't know if you notice, Australia's Prime Minister is talking about, you know, when Betty goes that um, Australia's, you know, the way forward for, for Australia is to be a republic. Um, and Yvonne's right, Robert, the, the monarchy is on its last legs. It's, it's not, you know, Charlie might make, to make it, but, you know, he's, what, 78? Something like that. Right. I, I think on, on Keir Starmer's point, I think it's good to ask, well, what nation is he talking about? Because it certainly isn't a, a, a United Kingdom, because the, there's if you look to Wales and Scotland, there isn't that same love for for the royal family. So uh, I think I think Keir is really trying desperately hard to play to that kind of Middle England base, but I don't know even know if, if they'll be if they'll be buying it. Um, I think he's he's kind of he's kind of got to do that, doesn't he? If he came out and did a, a Jeremy Corbyn, you see how the media down south reacted to that. Uh, so yeah, in terms of the other thing that's happened here. Sorry, we've got a wee bit of a delay. I cut across you. I beg your pardon, Robert. No, I was just um, on, on days being numbered for the royal family. I think it's certainly in Scotland and, and Wales, and I think it's right to wait out uh, Elizabeth's reign because um, I think that you can disagree with kind of principle of the royal family, but still respect her as an individual and think she's a uh, she's just a nice old woman, I guess, in, in many people's eyes. But after after that, and especially the history of Charles and. But I still think I've got a friend that lives down in uh, Cheshire in Tarpley, and he sent me photos today of his uh, the high street in Tarpley, and it's 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 it's, it's terrifying. Isn't it? <laughs> so I think I still think there's a, a deep love in certainly some parts of England. So I think um, it'll be a hopefully a, the United Ireland and independent Scotland. There'll be a little uh, isolated England with the outdated system outside of outside of Europe, and I think that's probably the future that's that remains for the royal family. That's what the future we want for them as well. <laughs> oh, um, on talking of Ireland, uh, Yvonne, um, and the Jubilee Honours, um, Mervyn Gibson, who, for those who don't know, is Northern Ireland's uh, uh, Grand Lodge of the or Grand Orange Order Secretary, was given an MBE, and uh, our, uh, Arlene Foster was given uh, a damehood for, I don't know, screwing up the a billion quid's worth of uh, heating or something. I don't know what it, she was giving it for. Um, it kind of, they don't see the optics of that, that the effect that's having um, on the non-royalist, loyalist communities of both Northern Ireland and Scotland. No, well, Arlene Foster did that, as you say, one billion pound smash and grab. Um, but uh, why should we be surprised you know th these are outdated uh, awards that carry empire in the title you know and and what does the empire represent mm. uh, there was a, a widow um, who was interviewed a few days ago um, and she still re she lost her husband in the Mau Mau uprising um, and, and still had vivid memories. 
and she uh, she is just repelled, you know, by all this pomp and ceremony and gongs given out and awards given out. Um, it, it really, it's bile inducing. And uh, the sooner we cut free from Westminster and all this nonsense, uh, the better. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and while all this is going on, up in Scotland this week, and a new conference, um, and they've come out with it. They've got to form a new yes group to get us independence, but we've got to sign up to a pledge to be included. Will you be signing to the pledge, Robert? Um, well, being living in Aberdeen, I'm well aware of the individuals involved, and uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, I absolutely would not be signing up to anything they're involved in, but I think I just can't believe the kind of hubris and arrogance. Who do they think they are that? They propose a a, a a pledge in front of a small audience of 200 people that had to pay 20 odd quid to get a ticket. And that's how everyone will be living their lives uh, for whenever this independence referendum comes. It's it's incredible and it's tone deaf. And I think it, it speaks to the kind of entitlement that many people within the SNP have at the moment. I think the biggest thing, and I think Alex Salmon admits this as well, is that it wasn't the SNP that made great uh, strides during the Yes campaign. It was the fact we had we were all parties and none. It was a, it was a movement together that wasn't wasn't managed from the top down. It was the grassroots that got out there into communities, not <laughs> making sure they were standing by each kind of uh, point on a pledge. It, mm -hmm. It's completely the wrong way to go for the movement. So I don't think I will be signing up to it. But if, if any of you want to, want to, then go ahead. What about you, Josh? There was 130... And that, I think, has been generous attendees. Um, would you be signing this pledge? Absolutely not. I mean, it's it, it's it's fear, Roddy. It's absolute fear. You know, it's 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 fear that they know that the, the SNP aren't going to move on an, an independence referendum. And I can, I hope that I'm wrong on that. I absolutely hope that we're all wrong. That we're all we're all have read it wrong, and that there is going to be a referendum. But I think you look at the first minister's comments recently, as I quoted earlier, and you know it's not coming. And it's fear that there's other parties that are going to start pushing for independence. That's all it is. It's just, it's fear. And as I said earlier, you know, the only party that I've got any tangible evidence of campaigning on is Alba. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. it was in our manifesto at Holyrood. It was in our council, you know, with the, the independence convention and also the wee Alba book in the town halls uh, that we've done. You know, I can't remember exactly off the top of my head how many we've done across the country, but that's the real evidence for independence, not some hall with people signing pledges. It's actually people on the streets talking to people and actually campaigning, and it's something that we can do now. So, no, nah, I, I think I'll stick to campaigning or instead of signing pledges. <laughs> Here you go. Um, in, in, in Holyrood, Yvonne, um, the Tories were complaining bitterly about this 20 million quid that apparently the Scottish Government set aside for a referendum next year. I really find it quite amazing. Although they're very silent, the Tories, about the 600 million quid that's spent every year out of the Scottish budget, mitigating their parties. Um, policies in Scotland. Um, do you think we will, ha you know, we will have a, a referendum next year? And if we do, should instead of this group be looking for a wee pledge and we agree to all their wee things, we should be trying to involve everybody in the yes movement. Well, That's the first step. Not money, not pledges, but again, everybody who believes in independence involved. Well, getting the referendum, um, I don't think, is, is the, the main obstacle. It's getting an SNP that wants the referendum. You know, I, I'm afraid that they'll say, yes, we'll, we'll get a referendum and give a half-hearted attempt uh, to, to get a referendum which will go backwards instead of forwards. You know, I mean, we went from a point of zero to 45% support in the 2014 referendum. And I'm afraid that uh, the SNP, if it does go for a referendum, will then do something to put a, a spanner in the works. And as for the Tories missing out on the six hundred million pounds, you know, you, uh, you can give these guys an open goal, and they'll still trip up at, at, at the point of kicking the ball 
um, towards the net, they're absolutely useless. Um, you know, the, the, it, it just puts in mind a, a one-legged man in an arse-kicking competition. I hope that <laughs> passes your watershed. But really, you know, the, the Tories, we can't... Uh, you know, they're about as effective as, as Labour is and in opposition in Westminster, you know, totally useless. And what surprised me about the £20 million um, sum was um, it doesn't sound like a great deal of money to no. promote um, a nation-changing event like the referendum. So again, my biggest fear is that the SNP will push it through, but it will be a very half-hearted attempt um, in the hope that uh, they'll still remain in power and, and uh, carry on with this farce that's called Holyrood. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, the, Robert, the thing is that you know, the SNP are not exactly... Um, efficient in anything they do. I mean, the news came out today that the census only had them um, just <laughs> numbers. Eighty-seven point five rate of Scotland, um, and the target to make it worthwhile is ninety-four percent. So that means that there's approximately three hundred thousand houses, three hundred thousand houses in Scotland haven't bothered to respond. Two things: um, will they be fined? Or should they be fined? And what use is this information um, if it's missing 300,000 homes? Um, will they be fined? No, because it's, it's, it's you, can't, you can't expect council to be able to go out and find uh, these people and, and find them. Often some of the poorest people in society will be out there receiving end of this £1,000 fine. It, it won't happen. Um, I don't think they should be fined anyway. I don't think it should be something that's mandatory to sign up. And I think it's quite unusual, actually, um, from some of my friends that are from other countries that they couldn't believe they had to fill out a census. Um, and how useful is it? Well, it's, it's not going to be very useful if people aren't, um, aren't, aren't filling it in, but it's also not going to be useful if you're allowing people to say they're born female when they're actually one. The data is going to be completely skewed by a small percentage of people who... Uh, and living in some sort of fantasy in many ways and I think um, the way they've gone about it is, is angered a lot of women, a lot of women I know I think that's that's part of the reason why turnout has been so bad for it and so if you're gathering useless data it's going to be useless and if people aren't filling it out it's going to be useless so it's, it's been a big big waste of time and I think but I think just following from Yvonne's point I think um I'm, I'm kind of guilty of this as well. When we talk about the SNP, um, what we really mean is that core SNP leadership. I think there's yeah. so many fantastic people still within the SNP who, if they get a referendum, will 100% be fully behind it and really want to win. And I think even if you look at the kind of breakdown from second party preferences the last election, there's a huge core within that SNP um, vote uh, between... Some play, in Aberdeen, it was between 10 and 15 percent were putting Alpa as their second choice over the Greens, and in other places, it was as high as 20 25 percent. So, I think for that, that's the next tranche of SNP voters. If there's no referendum next year, they are going to move over, and that will worry the life of people at the top of the SNP. So, hopefully, that will push some action on it. But I'm, I'm not confident, I share kind of same lack of confidence as Yvonne in this, yeah, Josh. Um, yeah. Both Yvonne and Robert have touched on but a lot of people didn't fill that in properly um, who are ignored. It. I mean, I saw people saying they were going to self-identify as a Jedi and things like that. Um, it's, it's been a waste of time, effort and money. And, and it's such a great thing to have if, you, if it's done and done properly. Absolutely. And I think, when it, I think it's just a symbol already of of just how f disenfranchised the Scottish government has become to actually what people want on the ground and how you know the ivory towers are so high above the rest of us. I mean, I don't. I, I seen the, the quick census. Um, I mean, I'm probably guilty. I might be getting chased for a thousand pounds. I didn't fill it out, but um, I mean, it was so long winded. I mean, the vast majority of people in Scotland have not got the time nor notion to fill that out. You know, and it, it didn't really have any sort of information that might actually be useful or used. You know, I mean, what information does the Scottish government? need to know that the attainment gap's not been fixed. What information do they need to know that, you know, food banks in this country are, you know, there was a report that almost one third or 
you know, if every single family had children that were using food banks, you don't need a census to tell you that that's not right. You don't need a census to tell you the housing crisis we've got, you know. It just seemed to be an exercise in futility from the very beginning. And then, of course, you know, the SNP leadership, being the SNP leadership, had to had to put in their own political ideology into it as well, just to rub salt into the wind. It, it, it's just baffling. And, and I know I completely agree with what Rob and Yvonne were saying as well in terms of the, you know, the referendum. And I think it's something that, as, as ALPA members, we're going to have to maybe try and shift a wee bit. And, you know, we were promised this referendum. This is not something that, you know, we should be we should be lax on. We have to be pushing for this referendum. You know, this is a referendum that people of Scotland were promised, the people of Scotland voted for, uh, and that's what they were elected on. So we have to be pushing for this referendum next year. It's, you know, it's not going to be OK just to say afterwards, oh, we told you it wasn't going to happen. We have to absolutely push for it and expect it to come. Although I'm sceptical that Rob and Yvonne are, but I think we have to push for it. We know that. Yeah, well, the thing is, Yvonne, that Wales, England um, and Northern Ireland managed to do their uh, census on time, which was last year, and on budget. We still don't know why the SNP, I mean, COVID, they said, is why we can't have a census this year. Well, if you're filling it out in the house in isolation. Yes, it seemed to be a bit I, of a I mean, nonsense. I have no idea why they couldn't have done the rest of the UK last year. Mm-hmm. No, it seemed to be a, a bit of a nonsense, and um, I didn't uh, fill mine out either. Uh, I just saw some of the questions, and and it, it just inflamed me, you know, because I just thought they they're really taking the mick now. And I did get a visit uh, from a, a, a guy from the council saying. Have you not filled out your census yet? So anyway, I, I did fill it out, but I just think that um, there's probably a protest vote attached to this. Uh, you know, the the council elections. Um, let's face it, was, was, there was just a wave of apathy over uh, the council elections and the turnout in some areas was below 30 percent um i think that was probably a protest uh, vote as well but the census i definitely think um there was a protest in that uh that people are fed up with this government and and want to um register some sort of protest and the the best way of doing it was uh, with the census because, you know, more than 300,000 homes is quite a significant number um, Mm. for somewhere the size of Scotland. Mm -hmm. It is. Um, Folks, the the clock is beating us, as always is. Always does. Um, Thank you for that. Good, mate, which I think, um, going back to the AIM conference with 130 people and they didn't have a spring conference, the SNP, I think come... October, when they have their, their actual annual conference, is going to be very interesting. And I think that protest you're talking about, Yvonne, will, uh, will show itself. And I wouldn't be surprised if the party that we're all members of have a much larger conference than they do. But time will tell. Um, time will tell. So thank you, Yvonne, Robert, Josh. Thank you very much for being here tonight. Um, and uh, we'll see you all soon. And to you, my viewers, I hope you've enjoyed all this. Um, as much as we've enjoyed bringing it to you. And until I see you again, please, please, please take care.